We've got a great topic. We've got a really large audience. And we have a very dynamic speaker for you today uh, talking about customer service satisfaction. So uh, let me just open with uh, one slide. We're going to have a, a, a very iterative back and forth uh, session for you today. Uh, so let me just start with a few comments about something I think everyone will agree, and that is satisfaction has become extremely complicated, uh, especially over the last few years, uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, we have different types of satisfaction surveys that we send to customers. We have those transactional uh, surveys that go after you close a, a support incident, and those are entirely focused on the experience the customer had with that particular problem. Uh, then you have those periodic surveys uh, that go out to the account holder. That could be the VP of, of whatever. It could even be the CIO. Uh, but often the people that answer those periodic surveys don't even use the products every day. So you get a very different set of input. Uh, and of course we have pop-ups, which are becoming quite popular uh, while you're using web self-service or looking at a knowledge base or uh, just looking at any information online, pop-ups about uh, whether this was useful or not useful. And, and those are pretty controversial surveys. Some people say only angry customers uh, answer pop-ups, and we know that the response rate of those pop-up surveys is really, really low. So a lot of different data points, sometimes conflicting data points, uh, and you add to that a lot of assumptions and myths, and we're going to be talking about some really interesting uh, myths today. But the fact is that our backgrounds and our personal uh, attitudes, whether we're a glass full or a glass empty kind of person, can definitely change your interpretation of satisfaction data. Uh, programs are definitely larger than support. Uh, now that uh, we're seeing links between satisfaction and loyalty, uh, we know that uh, executives are very interested in, in uh, customer sat and loyalty. You've got the CEO interested. Uh, Wall Street's asking about customer satisfaction in, in briefings. Uh, and you see analyst firms like Gartner uh, factoring in customer satisfaction to a vendor's rating in a magic quadrant. Uh, so it really has become a, a topic uh, for the entire enterprise and definitely the entire industry. Yeah, we're also seeing uh, companies approaching satisfaction in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the troubling trends I'm seeing in uh, some Star Award applications is companies are looking at all the different kinds of metrics and trying to pull them together into some sort of satisfaction index. Uh, which has a lot of potential. Uh, it also worries me that we may be uh, so enamored with these uh, loyalty scales that we're kind of losing track of what's influencing uh, that satisfaction and loyalty. So uh, a lot of uh, best practices, a lot of worst practices, and a, a lot of great customer examples that we're going to be sharing with you today. Uh, so for now, I want to turn things over to our guest speaker, Mike Clarkin, uh, to get us started talking about our storyline for today and the five myths. Mike, take it away. John, thanks very much for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and everybody, thanks for joining. Uh, Today, I hope to share with you some, some just uh, observations of our own experience. Um, if you don't know Sykes, Sykes is one of the largest global providers of outsourced contact center services. Um, you know, in the, in the course of our, our work with our clients, we have the, the luxury of seeing um, all kinds of customers in all kinds of situations, whether it be in uh, technology and telecommunications and financial services. Um, for, for a number of years, we've been uh, helping our clients with what I call customer analytics. Uh, it's something we call inside analytics, where we're looking for the real drivers behind customer experience. And, and through that, through that um, time, I, I think we've, we've come to the conclusion that there are a number of myths, or maybe you'll call them just conventional wisdom, um, the sort of um, rules of thumb that we use in the, uh, in the customer service business that sometimes can get you into trouble. Uh, and so today, really, the conversation is going to be about, you know, identifying and articulating what is the myth and what's, what's behind it, what causes it. Um, talk a little bit about um, how we've seen people work around it to be effective and give you some real examples of, of programs that have, have, have been drawn into the trap of one of these myths but found their way to the other side with great success. Um, maybe we start with just describing what five myths are and then we'll get into them one by one. Um, so the five myths are and these should sound familiar to you. Uh, the myth that the squeaky wheel is the most important wheel to, uh, to grease. Um, the, 
the conventional wisdom that, that the agent or just being friendly is the primary part of what drives customer experience. Um, the, the hope or the desire that if I just solve the problem, resolution will in fact create satisfaction. Um, the, the investment idea that if I spend more time with a the customer, they inherently will end up with a better experience. Uh, and finally, the, the sort of, I think the big one of all of them is that this idea that if the customer is satisfied, somehow we just hope and believe he'll be loyal. Um, so those are the five myths we're going to talk through. Um, we can start to through them one by one now. We'd like to do a quick poll while you're out there, um, and really just to see how you all view uh, customer experience and how you measured at your company. So you'll see a poll popping up now, and we'd ask you to uh, take a look and just pick which is the metric your company focuses on most in measuring customer experience. It's really an interesting topic uh, because I think companies even define customer experience uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious to see, uh, you know, which of these people think is the most influential with experience. I've found over the years that this can differ from country to country, that, that certain, certain methods get, uh, get preferen preferential treatment in other countries or sometimes with certain industries. Um, I think we're getting pretty quick uh, uh, participation here. Um, this is great. Okay, Stacey, so let's go ahead and close that poll out and see what the results are. Very interesting. So half the audience says overall satisfaction is your primary metric. Uh, interesting, 22%, maybe more than I would have expected that are uh, using that promoter in their companies. Um, customer experience score, which is one of the newer uh, models out there at, at, at 13, and, and first call resolution at eight. Uh, those, are, those are interesting. Um, just the, the breadth of the kinds of things that people are trying to use is very interesting to me. Let's dig right in, John. Okay, well, when it comes to satisfaction tracking, we've got a, a pretty uh, uh, sophisticated audience here, so I'm not surprised to see they're exploring a lot of avenues there. So let's get started with the number one myth, which is the squeaky wheel deserves the most attention. Uh, I, I uh, think that this is uh, really interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, what I have learned in 25 years of the customer service industry is, number one, some customers don't want to be satisfied. Uh, I think it's fairly safe to reference my mother, knowing she's not on this call. Uh, she's never been happy in her life and never intends to. So, you know, if she's the one you're, you're trying to uh, bend over backwards to make happy, it's probably not going to happen. And also, uh, I think you don't hear a lot about this right now because of the economy, uh, but during the boom days, especially here in Silicon Valley, there was a lot of discussion about firing unprofitable customers, and it turned out that some of those really squeaky wheel customers were costing you more money uh, than you were getting from them. They weren't uh, happy, they weren't referenceable, they caused, you know, problems and complaints at user conferences. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you really have to analyze those squeaky wheels uh, and see if it's really a problem you can solve uh, and if they're a customer you ultimately can be, uh, you know, profitable with. So, uh, Mike, come on, give us the, uh, the deep dive on this myth. Sure. Well, and, and I think, you know, any of us who've been working for a number of years in your companies, I think that the driver behind this is, is pretty obvious, and that is that um, you know customers who are complaining uh, oftentimes get um, get a lot of visibility internally. Um, you know, and I, I think you can hear it in your company. If complaints get attention because um, management says we're customer focused, and therefore no customer should walk away unsatisfied. Uh, if you have any. to escalations or complaints? Do your, does your senior, senior management team get any visibility of customers who complain or, or have a, a long-standing unresolved issue? And so, you know, these words that are on the screen here, if you get a lot of conversation in your company around, you know, escalations or complaints, uh, you know, attitude towards having zero defects, uh, paying attention to those who abandon, if churn matters a lot to your business or you hear a lot about frustrated customers, it is possible that as a consequence, the organization pays an inordinate amount of attention to the squeaky wheel. Um, so I think first it's good to understand what causes this um, this particular behavior. Um, and it's not a myth that you, have, that you should take care um, For most programs that we look at, 
you know, the, the squeaky wheel, the complainers, the, the bottom two boxes, whatever you want to use as your, as your measurement scheme, typically number in the five, six, seven percent range. And when you dig into that, what you often uncover is that many of those, you know, complaints or issues or problems um, are exceptions. They're, you know, a, a bad day for one of your service people or a particular problem that you don't get a lot of, you know, a product problem that creeps up that, that maybe is a little bit unusual. And those exceptions are, you know, they're, they're worth trying to fix, but it's important to note that fixing a single exception probably doesn't solve or help, you know, the other 95% of your customers. more systemic going on. And so while squeaky wheels are worth paying attention to, it's important to measure how many of them you've got uh, to decide how to react to them. So what we say is, you know, as you're monitoring your numbers and you see those things start to creep up a bit on you, you know, look for the patterns uh, that identify what's causing your squeaky wheel uh, and to see if there's um, you know, something more systemic under, underneath it. So as I mentioned before, it could be that you've got you know, a, a portion of your of your employee pool that, that does customer service that, that just isn't well trained, and so they struggle with certain kinds of problems. It could be, in fact, that you've got a, a product issue that that uh, a new release or a, a particular version that, that's causing a repetitive number of these cases to pop up. Um, don't be surprised to uncover the fact that you know a particularly tough or stringent policy or a policy change, like uh, not providing refunds for or taking a product out of out of service. Um, or, or not allowing people to um, waive fees, for example, might be the root cause of some of these things. Um, those are worth, you know, working at a, at a company level. Um, but if you really look at your squeaky wheels and you find that you have the odd cracked wheel, the occasional chip surface, the, the what I'd say here is our, our conclusion is now, really, once your bottom box or bottom two box numbers are below that 10% number, um, the squeaky wheels should just be part of your portfolio, but they shouldn't be your primary focus of what you're focusing on. Um, let me talk about an example um, of a program that, we've, that we ran, ran into a, a little while back, and, and this was a, a desktop printer for a client. Um, you know, there was a, you know, look at the numbers, there's that 12% um, bottom two box dissatisfied number that, that caused, caused the tension and concern and, and there was a as a consequence a large number of internal escalations, you know, customers sending complaint emails that got to the CEO and what have you. So there were a lot of attention and resources dedicated towards monitoring and managing those bottom two boxes. Um, when we when we worked through that with our client to do our customer analytics and understand what was underneath it, um, what we found was a just a large portion of these customers were frustrated by chronic And they had, you know, uh, programs in place to improve it, um, but hadn't all come to fruition yet. Uh, and, you know, tied to that, the agents had, you know, from a policy standpoint, little or no authority to replace or refund the product. Um, it was pretty much taken back to the shop. And so that was frustrating for callers as well. Well, so because of all the attention around the complaints and, and the sort of organizational intensity it created, um, what got missed was the other opportunity. And so when you look at this chart, you're, you're tempted to look at the bottom 12%. Um, but what really was interesting was this massive box and bu bubble in the middle of 75% that were neutral and only, and only satisfied. Um, and so while you have these product problems, you know, the other 88% of customers also weren't as satisfied as you'd hope them to be. 75% um, in the middle boxes. Um, and as we evaluated those experiences, um, customers felt like, the reps that they were talking to sounded scripted, like they were following a, a, a list that they didn't really know as much about the So when we evaluated the experiences that were happening in that very simplified top box, we heard you know, great education, we heard great confidence, we heard great listening and articulation skills. Um, and so, you know, good or bad, um, while the focus of energy was on eliminating those bottom 12%, which were really product system related, um, without a lot of effort and simply fairly moderate improvements, uh, you know, we were able to work with this, this program and, and move the overall satisfaction result by 10% increase by shifting people from middle to the top. Um, so I just want to say that the conclusion of this myth is that 
paying attention to this fat of our customers is not wrong. Um, but it needs to be done in proportion, and you need to know how much energy you give it based on how big the issue really is. Um, so once you've kind of gotten your bottom box stuff in order and it's under the 10%, refocus the rest of your energy back on the remaining 90. So uh, we're on to myth number two, which is the person is the experience. And uh, I uh, am familiar with this myth because I came from the retail industry, and in the retail right uh, and sometimes the people couldn't use the register but they knew how to smile at the customer and and be polite so what I found in the, the technical support world is uh, some companies do tend uh, to uh, put more emphasis on soft skills training than perhaps technical training and uh, not to be rude but you know sometimes that's little more than lipstick on a pig if the agent is extremely polite uh, it doesn't really matter if they're not able to answer the technical questions. So uh, I'm really interested to, to hear what uh, you've uncovered on this, Smith, Mike. Well, I, I, John, I think you're exactly right um, that, that um, you know, if the underlying processes aren't strong and, and the overall, you know, approach to resolution isn't good, you know, soft skills and, and, and being friendly just can't, can't save this experience. But I have to acknowledge that there's a reason why this happens. Um, so for anybody, you know, in the conversation today who, happens to manage the people in the room in front of you. And so it's it's simple to sit down and you know sit side by side with one of the call center reps or, or stand next to somebody at the counter and, and hear how they interact with the customer and, and provide coaching and feedback. You know, you could have been more empathetic there. You know, look the customer can hear a smile, so make sure you smile when you're on the phone. You know, that, that last conversation, if you used an empathy statement, you know, that would show them that you cared about their problem more. It's easily observed these human skills that we know people appreciate. Um, and so I think that there's a tendency to focus on them because they're easily observed and they're right in front of you. You know, it, it's the thing that's most obvious that you can work on. Um, but but what, we've had, what we've noticed, and again, why would, why would I call this the myth, is that um, if this is the only tool you think you have in your kit, the challenge is that they do make a difference, but they really, most have the impact when you're trying to differentiate between happy customers and really happy customers, that kind of satisfied to most satisfied. Um, so let me talk a little bit about how we've seen that at different stages of satisfaction and, and, and customer experience. With, um, you know, the, the skills you're working on are more what I call hard skills, um, you know, product and process knowledge, um, you know, just basic listening skills, uh, exhibiting a level of confidence in what you know, uh, and being articulate in your communication. These are things you learn in training. Um, you know, once you get those in bed, now you can talk about how to sh focus on rapport and ownership, explaining, you know, displaying empathy or diffusing anger. These are more of the softer skills. And so there's a time and a place where these are best applied, uh, and, and those that really have an impact of shifting satisfying experiences up to being very satisfying experiences. But uh, for me, it's a little bit icing on the cake. Uh, if, the, if the lower layers aren't in, in good shape, um, these can have a lot less impact than you'd like to believe. Um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that you may have more fundamental issues that work down at the bottom, like cumbersome processes, maybe slow systems, or again, technology to, um, to businesses um, and, and they have a big um, partner network in between um, and, and they took themselves a, a pretty typical 75 percent top two box top two box satisfaction goal um, that they just could never seem to quite get to you'll see that chart down the right they were in the 60 65 sometimes close to 70 but and, and they they listened to the, the calls they, they looked at the verbatims and the surveys and, and they suspected that agent skills and this sort of ability to be friendlier and more human were, were at the root. Um, when we helped them peel back the, the, the skin a little bit and see what was underneath the cover, um, what, we, what we learned was interesting, and that was that while those soft skills could be powerful at, at the edges, um, you know, this was a, a, a technical support process where 
the, the overall transaction could take days or weeks. I submit my ticket and some actions have to happen and maybe I get a response and, and, and those kinds of things could go on for a while and that was just the normal uh, flow of how things function. Um, matter how nice that individual transaction had gone for the for the caller or for the, for the email. They were more concerned about the fact that you didn't come back on Wednesday when you said you were supposed to come back on Wednesday. Um, and if you then fix that just meeting commitments aspect of it, um, what really as a hard skill was most important was the, the rep's ability to isolate a problem well to keep tickets from getting long in the first place. And so we found that there were more fundamental issues around isolation skills um, that mattered more than the soft skills. Um, so again, you know, here you look at it and you say, what are the levers that drive customer experience? Um, you know, in this particular case, making a meeting time commitment and overall ticket duration far outweighed the importance of the customer experience to any single transaction or conversation they had with a support engineer. Um, and I'd like ask you to think about, you know, your own business and, you know, what are the environmental factors or the process factors that can have the biggest impact um, that might undermine uh, customer experience before you ever get around to working on, you know, what the agent skills have to do. So we're up to uh, myth number three, and this one is really fascinating. I, I have to say, as we were uh, going through this material in rehearsal, I wondered if I'm partially at fault for this myth as well. Uh, the myth is that solving the problem always leads to customer satisfaction. And, uh, you know, we've seen so many surveys that show customers uh, want a fast, one-and-done uh, phone call experience, and I published a lot about the importance of first contact resolution. But of course, uh, as with any metric in a support organization, if you start focusing too much in any one area, you lose sight of the overall balance. And I definitely remember uh, early in my support career, uh, we were seeing uh, a trend of uh, satisfied customers due to first contact resolution, and I started rewarding my support techs uh, for doing that uh, FCR. And what happened, of course, is I was rewarding the wrong behavior, uh, and one uh, tech in particular started doing anything she could to get people off the phone so she could say it was a one-and-done incident and close it out. Of course, they always called back. Uh, an assembly line and you're doing anything you can just to kind of get rid of them. Uh, but I know there's a lot more to this myth than j just that. Uh, Mike, what have you found? Well, John, I think you're exactly right. And, and I, I, again, I think these myths are not universally bad or universally good. I think this, this challenge of this particular conventional wisdom is using first call resolution as your only metric has potential pitfalls. Um, and I think I understand why. Um, you know, the thing about measuring customer satisfaction is this guy has challenges as well. You know, you'd like to get a lot of surveys back from customers, but they don't always respond, you know, and, and sometimes you get, you know, one or two or three real customer feedbacks per per your customer service staff, you know, per, per week or per month, so it's pretty thin on data. Uh, so what's great about call resolution is that, one, you can measure You know how they're doing. Um, the, the challenge, that I think, is what you just said: is that you know, if you find that in your company you hear a lot of these things, repeat calls, one and done, and FCR are the mantra, then then you probably have a, a real emphasis around first call resolution. Um, this is some data from a recent analysis we did for a client, and and this is what troubled us, I think. So along the left side there, you'll see the, you know, the, the customers that said they had a superior experience, those that felt just short of that, and those who said they were unhappy, and those who said they really were disappointed. On the right, you'll see what the resolution rates were for those, you know, for those individuals. And so, what we struggle with, you know, understanding is while you definitely can see a trend that the happier the person is, the larger percentage of the people had resolution. Um, how do you explain people that had a great experience but still eight percent of them didn't get resolution at all? Um, and Uh, and so I think what we're concluding is that resolution is a yes or no question, um, and you guys all know as well as I do, um, measuring that can get fuzzy as well. You know, sometimes it's, you know, did they call back within a week? Sometimes it's, 
that I do my best and do everything that I would be allowed to. Uh, it doesn't always tie up with what the customer's experience is. Um, you know, here's an example I'd like to talk through that, that just helps us understand what some of the options might be. So this is a, a program that we worked on at one point for a, a cell phone manufacturer um, that ran into the, the dilemma that just didn't make sense to them. You know, our, our industry conventional wisdom is that good FCR levels should create good customer satisfaction scores. And, and here, their FCR levels were great and their CSAT scores were dropping. And it just didn't make any sense at all. The primary organizational metric was FCR, and I saw really up in the, in the poll that about 12% of the, of the population of the audience today said the same thing. Um, so, you know, with them, together we sat down and we, we looked at what was going on and, you know, looked at observing agents and how they were trying to solve problems. Well, what was interesting was the agents knew that the primary metric was resolution, first call resolution. So they were desperately hanging on to any in conversation and trying to first call resolution actually had the adverse consequence of frustrating callers who felt like they were you know, not being routed to the right expert and causing the overall time spent on the transaction to be double what it was in other parts of the organization that were you know, focused in a different way. Um, you know, simply put, what we ended up here was changing the, the idea about what constitutes resolution. And, and our, our conclusion was, look, the customer doesn't want resolution on the call at any cost. They want to be routed first and triaged first to the best resolution path. So you can imagine in a cell phone case, if it's not the cell phone manufacturer, it could be the shop where I bought it, or it could be the carrier, for that matter, who's best suited to solve a, a particular customer's problem. And so we trained the agents to do a triage first and to route quickly away those calls that somebody else was better qualified to handle. Um, you know, that had to be, you know, had to be reinforced by a change in the quality process and a change in the way that the call flows were designed so they weren't feeling obliged to hang on to and try to resolve every single thing that they could. Net, net, it shortened customer experiences, reduced total time spent, um, TSAT went back up, first call resolution came down. You know, again, what we found is that the conventional wisdom just didn't hold. And so I'd say to you here is that, um, you know, in your own situation, you know, resolution is part of the story. Um, but, you know, if you take it too far or you over rely on it, it can definitely cause some adverse impacts that you really don't want for your customers. So we're up to myth number four. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to mention we're already getting some great questions in queue. If you have a, a question for Mike or myself, go ahead and enter it. If we don't have time for all the questions at the end of today's session, we'll follow up with you over the next week. So I promise every question will get answered. But we're up to myth number four. And in some ways, this one almost seems uh, the opposite of the previous myth. And this one is that more time equals a better experience. And we're starting to hear this coming out of financial services industry, uh, who for so many years has tried to uh, push, you know, consumer banking off on consumers to go to the ATM and stop calling, stop seeing tellers, do everything online. And now they're starting to say, you know, it turns out that we want to spend more time on the phone with customers. Uh, it's one of the few live touch points, and we think that it influences satisfaction. So I'm starting to see specifically in financial services kind of a pushback uh, on that fast one and done and trying to spend more time with the customer. And, you know, again, if you go too far uh, with that idea, you're, you're going to run into problems. And a personal example, uh, for me, I'm a DirecTV customer, satellite television, and uh, those of you who have DirecTV know that anytime you have an issue and you have to reboot your, your machine, it takes about 20 minutes for it to come back up. And on my last uh, service problem, I had already gone through that a couple of times by the time I called uh, into an agent. And by the third time uh, that agent asked me to reboot, I was really near threatening their life because at this point I had been on the phone for two hours and they wanted me to do yet another boot, which I knew would do no good, but that's what their procedure said to do at the beginning of every uh, diagnostic step. So, you know, you're forcing the customer to spend 20 minutes of dead time uh, just hanging there. And so time is money. It's uh, money for you. It's money for the organization. It's definitely money for the customer. So maybe spending more time is better in some 
circumstances, but I think you've always got to be mindful of uh, what the customer thinks because it really is their time uh, we should be worrying about at the end of the day. Mike, what, what do you have on this one? And John, I, I, the, um, the scenario you describe is, is, is exactly one that we ran into in another situation. But let me describe this. I, I, we always try to figure out why these, why this conventional wisdom becomes so common and what drives the, the underlying need. And I think in here, it strikes me that it's it's, it's on our nature. We, we live busy lives, and um, whether it's at work or at home or with your school, I think that w when you give somebody your time, you feel like you're being generous. Um, you know, if I volunteer at the elementary school for my daughter or uh, and I do something in the community here, you know, where I, where I live, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm giving something of value. And I, so I think companies have the same view that if I just give my customers more time, they're going to appreciate it, and they're going to value me and, and appreciate the the, the how generous I've been, um, and I think there's they allow. So think about how this works out: is you now give your team the, the authority or the room or the latitude to spend as much time as it takes. Um, when you dig down and look into an overall operation, see where time is spent. You know, I'll take a call for an example. Um, clinical support team, typically, you know, maybe 10 or 15 percent of the calls account for 25 or 30 percent of the total time. There are longest outlying calls that consume a lot of the time that's being given or spent um, to your customers. Now, sometimes that's necessary because there really is a, a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, but more often than not, what we really see is that for a given transaction type, uh, whether it's, um, geez, I'm calling about my PC and I need to install this driver, um, you know, the, the the, the good case, the, the reasonable example takes 10 minutes, you know, that the outlier takes 25. Uh, where they call to say, I need to reinstall an application, the good case takes 18, and the long call takes 30. Um, sometimes these longest calls are only long because, you know, you have individuals that are having trouble being efficient or effective at actually managing the problem itself. Uh, and so what we found is that, well, as a company, you want to be generous with your time. Sometimes that time is being given to the rep to be inefficient without any sort of pressure to, uh, to, to, to conform to norms as opposed to giving it to the customer who you think might appreciate it. And so this and to calibrate your, your measures and your metrics and, and try to look for those outliers so the outliers aren't being perceived as being beneficial to customers and, and you really do coach and help out your, your uh, This is a, a laptop um, a manufacturer that had a company, which which I think was appropriate. It said we want the call call takes as long as it takes because they really do want to make sure they're not um, pinching on their on their customers. So you know I, I applaud the the intent. Um, and the two things that really struck us: um, customers didn't always want the time. Um, so even though the agent might have been doing it efficiently or or just being generous with time, saying look, this is going to take a reboot or we're going to have to reinstall this, I'll hang on the phone with you. Um, customers were as often as not wanting to say, look, let's hang up now. Uh, I don't want to waste your time. I'll call back if it doesn't work out for me. Um, but again, this is a little bit where, you know, first call resolution can go wrong for you. Um, here you've got a customer who looks at the at this experience and says, you know, you don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste yours either. Um, you know, they're, they're feeling almost guilty for consuming somebody's time that they think is not well spent. And so it's actually damaging customer experience, um, sometimes frustrating callers. Uh, who'd rather be more independent and, and come back and try it again. So um, in this particular case, you know, again, you've got to give permission to your team to allow second calls, you know, to overcome the desire to hold a customer on the phone, um, you know, and but also to, to help them understand how to be most effective at diagnosing problems to make sure you clearly know what the issue is so you don't send the caller off on their own and then have them discover it was the wrong problem altogether. Um, but we have seen that this definitely contributes to better customer satisfaction results and takes time out of your overall operation, so it saves companies money. Uh, and really what's happened is you remove the embarrassing or, or um, maybe guilty time, guilty feeling you've created to your customers for, for having them consume some of, the, some of your employees' time so, so much, so wastefully.
Well, we're up to myth number five, and I think you may have saved the best for last because uh, this could be quite a controversial discussion. Uh, the, the myth here is satisfaction equals loyalty or a blind. At one of our recent conferences, uh, we published a list of best uh, events based on the satisfaction scores. And one of the, the uh, breakout sessions listed on, on the top list was one that I had heard some uh, conversations in the hallway uh, criticizing. So I was kind of curious and went back and looked at those scores. And it turned out that if you averaged uh, the satisfaction scores for all of the sessions, this one just about closed, was at the very bottom of the scale. Uh, but it had a, a very high top two box score. So, uh, you know, it's very important that we don't lose sight of one metric because we start blindly following another metric uh, because every time you pay too much attention to one area, it means that you're ignoring information from another area. But, uh, you know, Mike, I know that we saw earlier in that survey a lot of uh, the listeners today are involved in Net Promoter and definitely Net Promoters become a very common approach to this. So talk to us about satisfaction versus loyalty and where you can get into trouble. Yeah, it's great. And, and you're right. You know, it was interesting in the poll that 50% of the audience said that, that their primary company metric is, uh, is overall satisfaction. Um, you know, the, the, our experience has been, and the, and, and the research that we've done says that in, in, in America, for example, 80% of companies use top two box satisfaction as their primary metric for customer experience. Um, that's not universal across the globe, but it's an interesting uh, a benchmark. Um, you know, ask yourself, what is your company or business or product line um, satisfaction goal? Most folks talk about top two boxes. And I, I think there are a couple of reasons why that has become the norm. Um, one is that, um, you know, top box seems like it's a tough thing to achieve. It's a small number. It doesn't sound like a very bold goal. It's better to say 75% is our goal or 80% is our goal as opposed to um, you know, 25 or 30. I think the second is that there's this skepticism that there's big differences between the, the second and the first box. Um, and so let's just lump them together and talk about them in, in, in aggregate. Um, but for those of you who are using Net Promoter, I, I think part of the great value in, in, in Net Promoter is distinguishing between how different individuals are who have a very satisfying experience or are very likely to recommend compared to those who are in that second box. And so if you look on this page and you compare the two scenarios that I showed here, which are really two different um, client programs that we've looked at. You know, on the left, you've got 75% top two boxes. Just happens to be the top box is only 25. On the right, you have, again, 75% top two boxes, but the top box is 40. So it's, you know, nearly double the, the on the left. You know, if, if I was standing up in the room talking to my CEO, I'd be saying 75% top two boxes. How does he know which one of these is underneath? And, and really, dramatically different if you're calculating this on a net promoter basis. The right side's got much higher net promotion, if you will. You know, the, 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 the advocates in that top box are far outweighing those who might be detracting in the bottom two or three. And this goes back to a topic we had earlier. Now is the time to think about, you know, what are the differences between the first and the second, you know, the superior and the just short experience? And what causes that to happen? And how do these then customers behave differently? Um, so, you know, we have seen that the best experiences are distinguished by a superior connection between the customer and the employee, everything else being done adequately, right? And, and we believe that customers want their service person, their rep, their whoever they're talking to, to be their personal advocate in troubleshooting and problem solving. Um, and we have observed that the best conversations and the best experiences exhibit certain um, attributes or characteristics, you know, a high level of ownership and confidence, um, um, expectation setting. And I put listening skills here, but what I really mean is there's been a connection, a, 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 a rhythm. You hear the rhythm between the caller and the, and the, and the rep, between the customer and the, and, the, and the service person. It says that we're both hearing each other, we're both communicating with each other effectively, we've matched. important to understand is that while you'd love to um, you know, exceed um, expectations every single time, if that's not you know, consistently possible as expectations keep rising, 
The alternative is to make the experience as easy as possible. Sometimes it's just about quickly snapping you to the process to get you off the phone and done today, or quickly quickly being to your coming coming to your house and solving your problem and getting away. Um, and this is where I believe there's a role in here for the you know, the customer effort you know, initiatives. as a net promoter would have you tell, that top box customer you know, is an advocate. They're out saying good things to the neighbors. They're out telling their colleagues that they're, they're more likely to be verbal about their experience with you. And if that matters to your company, then it's something to pay attention to and separating the two boxes. Uh, I'm going to talk you know, briefly about this example because I think it's interesting. This was a, for a wireless carrier of ours. And if this isn't in your business, you certainly can relate to this as a consumer. Um, who was meeting their customer satisfaction goals by and large um, and had gotten that 70 to 72 percent top two box thing going on. Um, but as we dug down into was a good transaction. You know, resolved, highly resolved, relatively efficient, and when you surveyed customers, they were pretty happy. But we were struck by a percentage of those where Customers were far happier, and when we listened to the exchange, what we really heard was a well-handled transaction, and then either the customer or the rep saying, well, I've got you here on the phone talking about your bill. Why don't we optimize your plan today? Um, and I think there was something loyalty building about the generosity in that, saying, you know, I don't know what the outcome's going to be. We might reduce your plan. We might increase your plan, but we're going to make it a perfect fit to what you're really doing. Um, the customers genuinely appreciated that was not part of the call flow design, was not part of the business process, but had a dramatic impact. And you'll see here the difference is you took, you know, top box from 21 to 30 tote. That's a 50% increase in advocates in your marketplace, um, a huge change in, in what the potential outcome was for the client. And so, um, you know, what, what it struck us to lead is that if they're really just paying attention to the top two box metric, um, this was something that got missed. But in here really was an opportunity to change uh, loyalty to impact churn ratios um, and really to, to change the overall primary business metrics goals of the organization. So I think John, that's it for my kind of talking through the five examples. Um, you know, what I really want to do here is summarize how we really think it all belongs together. Um, and, and if you if you can tell by the way I've discussed this today, you know, no one of these metrics is wrong or bad or inherently something you should throw away and not use anymore. Um, what pretty simple is first step back a layer and say, what's the company business goal? You know, if your big company issue this year is stopping churn, you know, you, you might look at one end of the spectrum. If on the other hand, you believe that encouraging word of mouth and getting you know more people to buy your product through references is the main business goal this year, or you want to increase wallet share, look and see where your where your goal is. And then, you know, choose the right measure. I, I think all these measures that, that people mentioned that they use have, have merit and can be used effectively. Some are better suited to certain situations than others, uh, whether it's likely to refer, repurchase intent, you know, NPS. So, you know, they've all got possibilities. You know, what we see on the right side is you got, whatever you pick, you got five boxes, there's really five distinct strategies for each one of them. And so when you're looking at the bottom, as we discussed in the beginning, you know, the, the, the bottom box scores is about managing exceptions and looking for patterns of dissatisfaction. Whereas in the middle, it's more about working on hard skills and remedying processes that, that inherently cause weakness. And then when you're trying to get to the top, now you're looking for soft skills, or you're looking for those more subtle uh, characteristics that really separate the good from the great. And so it depends on your current situation and how you're performing. But this for us is a, a fairly simple overview of, of a recipe you can apply. It says, you know, this quarter, we're going to work on something different. Here's one. So John, I think that's a, a kind of a summary of the overall model. I think we've got another poll here to look at. Um, and that is, we're going to pop this up again if you guys would like to participate. Um, you know, which myth is the one that you find most challenging to avoid in your company? Which one's the one you think has got the most um, most weight, or the most magnetism, and the one that gets in the way most often um, compared to the others? Well, I'm anxious to see how uh, these myths resonated uh, with the audience. Uh, you know, one final thought on on top box, if you're uh, ever discussing top box with another company, make sure you define what top box means to you. Uh, we did an audit last year 
on a company who had a five-point scale, and turns out they were including neutral uh, in their top box. So they were doing, you know, the top three boxes even on a five-point scale. Uh, so clearly, if doing top one or top two box, uh, you're going to feel. Uh, looks like the votes are slowing down a little bit. So, Stacy, why don't we uh, close out the poll and see what the results are? Look at that. I guess I'm not surprised that, that the squeaky wheel, that the complainers rule, is, is the is the one that people fall into the trap of most often. Um, well, hopefully, we've given you some. Um, and it tells me how powerful that particular metric has become, um, you know, and, and how to keep that in, in bounds is, is certainly challenging. Um, and this last one is good. I, I think this is one that I, I think is emerging now. I'm starting to hear more clients say, hey, let's separate the first and the second box, but it's still not that common. So I think we're in a position where we can take some questions. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, John. Uh, yes, we do have several questions in queue. And I want to first thank the, both John and Mike for an excellent presentation, a lot of really great takeaways that our attendees can you know, get some real value out of. So let's move into the, our Q&A time frame. And Michael, I want to, to send the first question your way. So we know that in order to implement you know, these types of changes, you generally need to have a level of internal interest or buy-off, if you will. So where do you find the greatest interest in this is it in the, in the client's hierarchy? Is it at C-level, senior executive, or mid-level managers? Um, it's a great question. I think the different levels have different areas of, of interest. Um, in, even in my own company, I would say you know, they also want to know that we don't have very many people in the bottom box complaining. You know, and so we have to reassure them you know, with our surveys to make sure, hey, we kept this under control. It's only 4% this quarter. Um, but I think if you want to get a more balanced approach to measuring customer experience, um, I find that middle-level management, you know, will, will gravitate towards having multiple metrics and, and multiple strategies because I think they have typically a long punch list of things to work on. So I think you can work with your operations management um, or even your marketing management to, to find a, a, a few metrics that you want to use or a, or a few strategies you want to use to impact this. That, that that's the place to go to go talking. Great. Thanks, Michael. John, this next question is for you, and it's, it's about how TSIA tracks satisfaction. Is it something that we benchmark for tech companies? Uh, we do uh, track satisfaction in the, the benchmark. It's actually the only metric we track across every one of our service disciplines. So whether you're field service, education, professional services, or tech support, uh, we do benchmark satisfaction. But what do we actually benchmark? Uh, we do track uh, post-interaction satisfaction across phone, email, chat, uh, and web self-service. I believe those are, those are all the channels we currently track. Uh, and uh, we also track uh, overall satisfaction, those six-month or uh, annual surveys that, that are so common in the B2B world. Um, I think that we ask, we track the percentage of companies that are using Net Promoter but I don't believe we're actually tracking the net promoter scale, uh, whether you're, you know, what your actual uh, result is. Uh, but uh, we also get into a lot more detail on, on uh, satisfaction in our auditing programs. Obviously, a big piece of the JD Power certification program uh, is the customer satisfaction piece. JD Power surveys your customers. Uh, for a third-party look at satisfaction. And that's where uh, we see companies getting into trouble with those kind of confusing satisfaction indexes that they may be really surprised at the numbers that J.D. Power pulls in from your customers. So uh, we do have a lot of data. So uh, if you're interested in how you compare, uh, open up a, an incident and uh, you know we'll work with you and see how your numbers look compared to the benchmark numbers. Thanks, John. And Michael, the next few questions are for you, so I want to get us through those. Okay. Um, are, you, are your remarks and findings, are they global in nature, or are they more US-centric? We have an attendee that's wondering if there are differences across the various countries. You know, we've done this kind of analysis uh, around the globe. You know, 
looking at countries like Australia to Germany to Spain to Argentina, and I mean really you know domestic callers you know in these situations. And, and while there certainly are differences in marketplaces, um, these tendencies or these myths we find everywhere. So I think these potential pitfalls are more. as I mentioned, is for you as well. So we have an attendee that you know, they're wondering, if, if you don't go with first call resolution, how do you make sure that the employee has the time to solve the problem and also keep the focus on quick resolution and closure of the case? Yeah, it, it's, um, look, I, don't get me wrong, I like first call resolution as a metric. I think it's important to have. I just think it's, it can't be the only metric you've got. Um, you, you're, you're exactly right. It's important to benchmark how long it should take to solve a problem, a given, a given problem type, and to have, you know, your, your reps have either a, a time-banded goal or a, a, you know, a resolution goal. Um, and in your quality processes, you, you want to check and say, did they resolve it as it should have been, or did they miss an opportunity to resolve it? And I think that's a good place to look at it. Um, but if that's the only metric you have, there are so many potential, you know, things that can, can behaviors that can be caused that you don't like. That it just needs to be balanced by something else, maybe related to a customer experience goal, and allowing people to have the latitude, like I said, to give permission to not resolve. Kenny, that's saying that you know their response rates are very low, and how how do you collect satisfaction data? What is the best way to do that? Well, it's a great question. I'd be interested in uh, Mike's input on this one as well. Um, response rates have been declining uh, over the last decade, and uh, as we all get more busy, uh, we just don't respond to all those surveys like we used to. Uh, a couple of uh, hints, uh, definitely the faster you can get that survey to the interaction that you're surveying on, uh, the higher the response rate. Uh, we also uh, know that if you communicate uh, ongoing with the customer about your satisfaction programs, what you're doing with the input, changes you've made because of satisfaction scores, uh, customers tend to give you a lot more respect and will take the time to fill out the surveys. Um, I also think we ought to look at maybe some new opportunities for collecting data. Uh, there are a lot of new tools out there uh, in the social media world uh, for monitoring what companies are saying about your company uh, what customers are saying about your company and your products and blogs and uh, community posts, et cetera. Uh, so we're seeing some new analytic engines that are kind of judging satisfaction and uh, overall state of the brand uh, based on that. So I think that's a, another way we'll uh, be seeing companies in the future trying to get more data. Uh, what do you typically use at Sykes? What do you see as the, the best way to get uh, good response rates on your surveys? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think the, the, the age-old um, technique has been outbound calling, and, and while it's very uh, balanced and you get nice, um, you get nice uh, statistically valid data, it's sometimes an affordability issue as, a, as well as you know, getting a hold of folks. It can be challenging. Um, so a lot of people are using email, which I think is great from a, you know, how many you can reach for a low cost. What I've seen a lot of new occurrences of, um, Don, is um, post-call IVR surveys um, that people opt in, and, and as long as you keep the survey short, you can get some very quick, immediate feedback. And social media will be interesting. Um, our observation today is that social media tends to draw out the squeaky wheels. Um, so be careful not to overreact to that stuff, but it certainly can tell you something about what's going on in your bottom boxes. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, John. Michael, this next question is for you. With myth number two, you talked about you know the person is the experience. So if the aging soft skills are good enough, satisfaction scores will be where they should be. But we also mentioned that without technical knowledge, soft skills are kind of just addressing, if you will. So we have an attendee that's wondering whether or not it would be fair to assume that that same technical expertise issue would apply to resources that go on site to fix problems. Oh, I think absolutely. I, you know, in my own personal experience with the uh, with the home internet provider that I've got here. Um, you know, I've had a couple different um, on-site visits by by technical staff, and you know, 
the thing about what you makes you appreciate the person was, yes, I appreciated his ability to communicate with me, and tell me what he was finding, what was going on. There's a layer of criteria here, and that has to get accomplished first. And then, if he's also nice and tells me how it worked out and what I should do next differently next time, I think that's the layer on top. So I, I think it applies absolutely, whether it's you know in the store or you know on a site visit, you know at a, at, a, at, a, at somebody's house or, or on a, in a call center. I think the, the model is definitely transferable. Thanks, Michael. And as we are two minutes to the top of the hour, I have one more question that I want to squeeze in for you, Mike, as well. Um, do you see that? that top two box is usually a five-point scale versus a seven-point scale? Are there, are there any metrics on how companies, how many companies use what? Well, there are a lot of scales, I agree. I, I will say that, um, by and large, I, I'd say um, there's, a, there's a tendency towards five-point scales these days. Um, you know, the NPS universe tends to stretch that to a 10-point scale or an 11-point scale. Um, but but the, I'd say the predominant, kind of like what we saw in the first poll there, I, I'd say that 60, 70% of the, the businesses I run into are using a five-point scale. Seven-point scales, you know, have an equal statistical validity. You know, you have three above and three below, you know, the, the average, the same like a five-point scale. So they're, they're just as statistically valid, but it seems that they were in favor of some five or six years ago when they started to say, I, I can think of one program right now where they're still using a seven-point scale in our portfolio. Um, and I... I don't know that any one of them is better. What really matters is that you stick with one and you trend it and you, you know, divide up the boxes into logical steps that make sense to you. Thanks, Michael. I, I, I want to give um, our presenters a chance to leave any last thoughts with our attendees. We do have quite a few questions still left in queue, but I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that we will follow up with you via email so that you can get those questions answered. But John, I want to turn it over to you now just to, to have, to give, how do you give any last thoughts to our attendees? And then, Mike, if you could follow up. Well, I, I think what I have learned here is just the importance of balance and that too much focus in any one area uh, can, can really, you know, set you off kilter. And uh, for my years uh, running support centers, uh, it seemed that, you know, about every quarter or so, uh, we would have a new initiative uh, for a budget reason or a satisfaction reason or because of a press article or something uh, that would make us really kind of tip toward focusing on talk time or resolution or uh, hold time or abandon rate, but, you know, we would kind of, all of us start worrying about one metric in particular. And I think what we've learned today is that if you ever lose sight of the balance across all of these metrics, uh, the customers suffer. Uh, so I would say make sure uh, no matter what the, you know, the most recent drive is to raise, raise a number or lower a particular number, make sure you're not taking your eye off that overall uh, big picture because uh, that seems to be a common denominator in a lot of these myths. John, I completely agree. I think this is about balance. Um, and I think it's also about recognizing that different tactics work in different situations. And so there's no one size fits all. If I just do good resolution or I just do good soft skills, that that, that blanket approach is unlikely to create broad movement of, of your customer experiences up the scale. So it, it's really about saying, you know, in one box I need a screwdriver, the next one I need a hammer, you know, this one needs a wrench. You know, you've got different tools to apply, and I think if you take away from this, too, you know, choosing the right tool and, and being comfortable working on that one one ratchet at a time, that's, that's what I would ask you to, to remember today. Great. Thanks again to our presenters, uh, John Ragsdale and Michael Clarkin, and thanks to you, our attendees, for joining us once again.